Traditionally, Muslims begin uh, anything that they do that's worth doing. There's a hadith that says anything worth doing should begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which is also the actual first statement in the Quran. If you open up any Quran, the very first thing that will be read is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which means in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. And Rahman and Rahim are derived from the same root because Arabic words, and I'm probably going to talk about this a lot over this course uh, of lectures, Arabic words are built on triliteral roots. The Semitic languages are root-based languages. So Hebrew has the same phenomenon. You're dealing with a language in which a semantic field or a constellation of meanings emerges out of primitive root structures which are based on three letters generally, sometimes four. But the vast majority are three-lettered, which is interesting in terms of cosmology. Three is a very interesting number uh, because it, it introduces the idea of <coughs> multiplicity. From the one came the two, and from the two came myriad forms. So three is literally the beginning of multiplicity. And so language by its nature, which is almost inexhaustible, in a sense, and could in, a, in, in reality be considered inexhaustible, is built in the Arabic language on three. Now, the Qur'an itself is a word which also comes from a root word. And there's some differences about it, but generally, in English it's written like this and now becoming more popular like this. Generally the word, the, the root words here are qa, qaf, ra, and ya. And these are three Arabic letters. Qaf is really a letter that probably we, we don't have an equivalent. It's, it's, it's done in, in using something in your throat by squeezing the upper portion of your throat together and uh, ejecting this, this uh, sound, qa. Qa. So it almost sounds like a crow. But the, the second ra is similar to our, our letter r, ra, and then ya. <coughs> At its root meaning, you get the word for city. Which is interesting because it brings in the idea of civilization. And traditionally civilizations are built on books. The vast majority of human civilizations, you will find that there is fundamentally a book at the core of the civilization. For the Greek civilization, it would probably be Homer. And for the, in other words, we, we can't really imagine a Greek civilization without Homer, given what we know about the Greeks. Plato is dependent on Homer. The, uh, the playwrights are dependent on, dependent on Homer. For the Hebrew people, it was certainly the, the Torah, or their Bible. And this will become the foundational book for the Western peoples, the European peoples. The Bible really becomes a foundational book, first in Greek and then in Latin, and ultimately for the English-speaking people, the King James Bible. For the Arabs, interestingly enough, there is no book in the Arabic language until the Quran. There's literally no book. They're an ancient people, and yet there is no book in the Arabic language until the Quran. Prior to that, the closest thing that you could consider literary was poetry that was done orally. And there were seven odes that were quite popular that were hung in the Kaaba, in the house in Mecca, and were honored by the Arabs, the pre-Islamic Arabs, as being the quintessence of eloquence and of the uh, Arabic art form of poetry. So when the Quran comes to these people, this is a radical departure from any previous concepts within the culture of knowledge and the transmission of, of knowledge. There, the other root that you're going to find in here is the word to recite. 
And qara'a in the Arabic language means two things. It means to read and it means to recite. So it has an oral and it has a written quality to it. Now interestingly enough, if you look at, there's a really wonderful book which I recommend, it, particularly all of you since you're teachers, if you haven't read it, it's really worth reading, which is called A is for Ox by Barry Sanders. And this book is talking about the fact that orality is the substratum of literacy. If you do not have an oral tradition, you cannot have a literate tradition. And one of the things, one of his complaints is that our culture is losing its orality. The oral tradition in this culture is dying out because of television and other forms of media in which visualization and not orality becomes the dominant means of raising our children. So if you look at children for the first five years of their life, they are oral creatures. They're in the oral world. They're not literate. They're in the oral world. And traditionally what would happen is they would hear stories and their imaginations would be ignited. And this was something that, that, that took place in all cultures. Now in this culture, the recent phenomenon is children being raised in front of the television. So the mother is no longer transmitting uh, the oral lore, the childish lore of the culture to these children, but in fact it's being experienced through the medium of visualization, which is a powerful medium, but it has certain effects. And uh, Sanders believes that, that one of the effects is, is the lack of humanization, that he believes that orality is a process of humanization. The fact that the Arabs are an oral people is very significant. They're, they're an oral people, and the Qur'an is a Qur'an before it's a book. In other words, the real meaning of Qur'an is the recital. It is the oral book. And the, the next word that the Qur'an is identified as is kitab, which means book. And kataba, the root word, means to join together. It means to join together. So what happens with the Arabs is that in 570 uh, of the, the Christian era, a, a boy is born in Mecca to a mother who his father dies uh, prior to that, during her pregnancy, Amina. And this boy is named Muhammad, and during this time, uh, for the first few years of his life, he is sent to the desert, to the oral Arabs, to learn the language through this tradition of the Arabs in raising the aristocratic Arabs would send their children to the desert Arabs because they considered that they were the most eloquent Arabs. And they wanted the children to absorb the language within the first five years of their life because they recognized that children that were raised amongst these, uh, these people who spoke a very powerful Arabic would have also strong Arabic even if they spent the later portion of their life in the city. And so during this time, for the first 40 years of this man's life, really from all, if we look at it just in terms of a, a human life, very little uh, matters of significance occur in this man's life. By all intents and purposes, one would really say that had the Prophet not reached his 40th year, that he would have been known amongst his people perhaps for one thing only, which was that he was extremely trustworthy. He was a very quiet person, he did not speak much, he did not quote poetry, he was not a poet, he was not known to uh, engage in discourse with the people. He was a con uh, contemplative person. He liked to go off uh, and uh, reflect on his own. He was known to be extremely kind to uh, poor people, to orphans. This is all mentioned in the tradition. Other than that, he had no aspirations of being a leader within his people. As, as some people would. He was from an aristocratic clan, but he happened to be from a sub-grouping uh, within that clan that was on bad times, Beni Hashem. Now, pr just prior to his 40th lunar year, because the Muslims, uh, when they talk about years, 
they, they're talking about lunar years, which is about 11 days short of a solar year each year. So his 40th uh, lunar year would probably be about 39 uh, years of age in terms of solar, a little, little less probably. At, at the age, just before his 40th birthday, he began to see some dreams in the tradition, but he would go off to a mountain just outside of Mecca, which is called Jebel Nur, the mountain of light. And during that time, the word that was used to describe what he was doing was tahannuth. And in Arabic, hint is, is polytheism. Tahannuth means to avoid polytheism, to avoid idols. So he was going out to this place and he would meditate in this cave. And we really don't have a description of the actual practices that he was doing. But there was a tradition amongst the Arabs called the Hunafa or the Hanif. And these were people who were inclined towards a type of monotheism. They did not worship the idols, they did not believe in the idols, but they did not necessarily speak out against the idols of the, uh, the, the Jahili Arabs or the Arabs prior to the Prophet Muhammad's mission. So he would go to this cave and in the 40th year, in the month of Ramadan, he had an experience. Now there are many ways to look at this experience and Western Orientalists uh, generally uh, said wretched things about the Prophet. If you read early traditional literature coming out of Europe, just really not very nice thing. They've become a lot nicer recently. Since oil was discovered in the Arabian Peninsula, there needs to be diplomacy when we talk about people's uh, beliefs and traditions, when you have interests involved there. So Orientals have definitely become, that's a cynical way of looking at it, I think maybe there's been some growth as well within the academic community. And certainly the, the, uh, the impetus for attacking Islam prior to that was often based on an almost evangelical type of Christianity that existed particularly within the Protestants uh, in England, the Anglican Church and others, who really felt it their duty to Christianize the world. There was a very strong ideal that we should civilize the world and certainly the Arabs uh, need it just like anybody else. And then you have a long history within the Western tradition of uh, just a, a type of antagonism between the Islamic uh, forces because they were, they were world power for centuries and the Christian forces in Europe. I mean that tension really they were coexisting with a lot of tension with few exceptions in different places like periods of time in Sicily for instance during the time of uh, Rod, King Roger of Sicily where there was a lot of uh, interpenetration uh, going on between the Arabs and the Christians. So in the 40th year, uh, anyway, these Orientalists basically uh, would traditionally say things almost like that he had epileptic fits, uh, this type of thing. The, the more recent Orientalists, and not just Orientalists, but even theologians like Hans Kuhn wrote an interesting book called Christianity and the World Religions. One of the things he says in there is that we have to stop uh, speaking uh, derogatorily about the Prophet Muhammad because whatever was taking place there, uh, it was certainly uh, by all accounts that we have a sincere Phenomenon. In other words, he's not willing to accept, and that's his prerogative, that this was a revelation, but he is willing to accept that the person was sincerely deluded, which is a big difference from simply saying that he was insane or that he was mal, had malintention, right? The experience was basically this. It's come down in the tradition that at the age of 40, he was in the cave and a being came to him it was in the form of a man, and he said, Iqra. This was the first word, Iqra. Now, Iqra can be interpreted two ways. It can be interpreted recite or read. Now, the Prophet Muhammad was not, he was neither a reciter of poetry, nor could he read. And he said at that point, he said, Ma'ana biqari. I don't know how to recite or I don't know how to read. It could be interpreted both ways. Generally it's interpreted that he did not know how to read. Iqra a second time, Iqra a third time, and then in the tradition it says that he was actually squeezed until he thought that his sides would burst. And then he said, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram. Alladhi allama bil-qalam allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. 
And this is the beginning of this phenomenon that will take place for the next 23 years of his life before he dies. The revelation said, read in the name of your Lord who created the human being from a, uh, a clinging tissue. Read in the name of your Lord the most generous who taught the human being with the pen and taught the human being that which he did not know. That's not a very eloquent translation, but I'm just doing that uh, directly from the Arabic, and I'm sure the text will have a better, uh, better interpretation there. At this point, the prophet was concerned. He did not know what was happening to him. He went down to his wife and uh, explained to her what happened. His wife comforted him. Khadija al Kubra. She said to him, she was an older woman, she, and her uncle had been a, uh, uh, an Arab who converted to Christianity. She was familiar with Revelation. She said, You are a good person. You take care of the orphan. You take care of the widows. You take care of the needy. And I don't think something bad would happen to you like this. Because he thought that this might be like a, uh, some kind of evil spirit or something. I mean, he really, he did feel that. They go, she takes him to her uncle Waraka bin Nofal, who had some knowledge of previous books. And he says a very interesting thing. He said, this is the Namus. Now, for people that know Greek, Namus comes from Nomos. Right? And Nomos means the law. So he, in other words, he was saying, this is Namus that came to Musa. In other words, you are being given a revelation. That's what this is. And he told him, your people, when they find this out, will become your enemies and drive you from this city. And he said, would they do that? Because he had never done anything wrong to them before that. And he said, they will do that. And I wish that I could, was a young man that I might be by your side doing this. Now, during the next period of time, he begins to get these revelations. The next one, Ya Ayuhal Muzammiru. Oh, you wrapped, because he used to wrap himself when he would meditate, wrapped in a cloak. And these revelations begin to come with a regularity. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, in a description, وسلم, he said that sometime the revelation came like a bell, like the ringing of a bell. In other words, it was like it began as a vibration, and then it would move into. Uh, to letters and then into the actual <coughs> words. And it's interesting because if, if, when, when you hear, for instance, there's a group of letters that many of the chapters of the Quran begin with. 19 chapters in the Quran begin with these letters that are called muqatta'at. And if you hear them recited, they, A'udhu binahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif, Lam, Now you can hear the vibratory, uh, the vibratory uh, force there. And this is how some of these revelations were beginning, literally like a vibration uh, moving into the material world from another realm according to the Muslim tradition. During this time he began to tell close people. And Khadija is the first person who believes him, his wife, which is interesting. Um, she didn't, you know, abandon him. She was right there and she said, I believe this. His uh, nephew, who was his cousin, who was living in his house from his uh, uncle, the son of his uncle, he was taking care of him, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was a young boy at that time, but he also uh, says that he believes, tells him that he believes in the tradition. And then other people from very close people that knew him, Abu Bakr as Siddiq was a very close person. But at a certain point, he's commanded to warn his family. So he, he, he gathers them all together and he says to them, what would you say if I told you that there was an army on the other side of the mountains of Mecca waiting to attack you? And they said, we would believe you because you're an amin, you're the trustworthy one. And he said, what would you say if I was a messenger of God and uh, I was sent to you? And they said, we don't believe you. And they rejected that. And then, as more people begin to come into Islam, 
the Quraysh began to get worried. And it's very interesting what they said. They said, to, they said about the Prophet, they said, Yusafihu ahlamana. He makes us look stupid. Because he was saying, do you worship pieces of wood and stone that can't hear or speak or benefit you? And so that bothered them. And there's, a, there's an interesting analogy in the Quran with uh, Ibrahim or Abraham where he, he, there's all these idols that his people worshipped. And one night he goes in, he was only about 12 or 13, he goes in and he smashes all of the idols except for one of them. And he puts the axe in, in the big one. And then he leaves and they come back and they find all their idols smashed. So they say, this Ibrahim was talking about this. They go get him. And they say, who did this? And he said, ask the big one. And they said, what do you think, we're stupid? He can't, they, he can't say anything. And he said, then why are you worshipping him? And then it's a very interesting verse in the Quran. It says, they became self-reflective. Very interesting. They became self -reflective. Suddenly they said, he's got a point here. Now this became uh, troublesome for them because at that point a window opens and it can close very quickly and somebody shouted, get rid of him, right? And then it becomes a mob scene. Yeah, let's not think about this, let's kill him, right? <laughs> now there's an interesting uh, German philosopher, who, uh, Heidegger, who has a, a theory about what he calls um, thrownness. That human beings are thrust into a certain environment and they, they literally take on all of these qualities not based on their own individual uh, reality but based on what everybody else has told them. And so we learn about the them very quickly. And there are certain expectations within the context of them, the, the other, like that we don't belch in public. Right? I mean, we learn quickly that there are certain things we don't breach. And they're not things that we chose, they're things that are imposed on us. And obviously they have uh, purpose and, and uh, you know, we're civilized people, right? We don't do certain things. But also there's a type of, what Heidegger felt was a type of inauthenticity that went with that. Because people really hadn't reflected about who they were in their essence or, or their essential nature. They were really simply only confirming what had been reflected back to them from their culture and their society. And people that break these models, in England they would be called eccentrics. Right, people that don't, and the English actually kind of allow for that within their culture, that, that, but you have to be rich, that's a prerequisite. Because <laughs> if you're poor, they call you mad. <laughs> so, so, but Heidegger felt that, that a person who had, who had never come to terms with this, he called it an undifferentiated person. They really had never thought that, the only reason I am the way I am is because I grew up in a certain culture and environment. And, and this culture and environment has completely imposed upon me a way of viewing the world, a language that involves a world view. All of these things are literally superimposed upon us and we submit to them without reflection, by and large. Now, Heidegger's solution to it was, uh, he said the only authentic act that you could really do once you realize this was die. <laughs> in other words, n nobody's going to teach you how to die. Nobody's going to, you will do that very authentically. <laughs> so he said you become a being unto death. But for the Muslim, and I really think that the Quran really did this to these people, it forced them to look at what Hagar would call their throneness. In other words, why are we worshipping these idols? Why are we uh, burying our, 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 girl, our baby girls alive? Because who, people didn't think about it. You see, it's like in certain cultures, I mean, in this culture we have a very serious crisis where there's reflection on both sides with the abortion issue. I mean, you know, there's people who say, this is wrong. And, and we hear that and we have to think about it. Whereas in that culture, nobody was there saying it was wrong. They were saying it was perfectly acceptable. Now here comes a man who starts saying, this is wrong. That's a very strong thing for a people who have not given a lot of reflection to themselves or their cultures. So the Qur'an begins to literally question things very deeply. And the first period, which is 13 years, is called the Meccan period. Now during the Meccan period, the dominant themes 
within the Quran are primarily what in Arabic is called Tawheed. Now Tawheed is sometimes translated as uh, monotheism, which is, I don't like that translation. The actual word in Arabic means to make one. If you translated it quite literally, it would be the making of one. But the word means, from a Quranic perspective, is worshipping Allah or God with absolutely no association in that worship. Nothing is associated in that worship with God. Nothing whatsoever. And this is, if you want one word that will give you the theme of Quran, it's this word. And this is why the Muslims have, in, in the Western uh, uh, comparative religious tradition, have, they have been called radical monotheists. <coughs> more so than the Jewish tradition and more so than the Christian tradition. The Muslims are considered radical monotheists. One, there is absolutely no anthropomorphism in Islam. There is no association of God with creation. And the, probably one of the most definitive verses in the Quran about the nature of Tawheed is Laysa Kamithihi Shaykh. There is no thing like God. The early community said, whatever occurs to your intellect, God is other than that. The companion of the Prophet Abu Bakr, the Siddiq, the second Khalifa, or the first Khalifa after the Messenger, said, your inability to comprehend God is your comprehension of God. Your inability to comprehend God is your comprehension of God. That is the essence of Tawheed. Now, here's where we get in a problem. We say, if God is unknowable, then how do we know God? Right? Now, it's interesting because within the Christian tradition, the first person to really deal with this issue I, I mean, there's probably Tertullian, uh, you might have some inklings of it, but the first person really to deal with this issue is probably Kierkegaard, who's a very interesting philosopher. Because Kierkegaard recognizes suddenly that the knowability of God, there's definitely a problem there. Now, the way the Christians have tended to deal with that is through Christ. Christ becomes the object of God's knowability. That God becomes man so that man can understand God. Right? I mean, this is, this is an element within Christian theology. For the Muslim, the knowability of God is through the creation itself. And this is why much of the Quran is focused on telling people to explore the creation itself. Because the creation is seen as a theater of manifestation, of divine manifestation. That God is not entering in, is not incorporated, is not becoming, uh, in, in, he, he is not becoming, uh, in, embodying himself into the creation, like incarnation is becoming the flesh. And likewise, what Montgomery Watt would like to suggest is that somehow God has imbibliated himself, nice fancy PhD word, <laughs> that God became book, right? Which is not true. The Muslims do not look at that. Even though they do believe that the Qur'an is an attribute of God. That this Qur'an that we have here, we do not say that this is God's, uh, you know, God on earth or something like that. No. Although we do believe that the Qur'an is the speech of God. And we believe it's the uncreated speech of God. In the eternal meanings that move into the vehicle of language. The intentions of God. That is the speech of God. So Tawheed is a, a very important theme. The next idea is the idea of Akhirah. And Akhirah means what comes after. It means the end. The hereafter. The interesting thing about the Arabs is the Arabs did not believe in a hereafter. Many traditions uh, have a hereafter. The Arabs did not believe in a hereafter. They thought, this is it. When you die, it's over. And they said, if we're bones and dust, will we be brought back to life? The Quran says, 
The one who brought you, who created you the first time is capable of creating you a second time. In other words, the fact that you've come into existence one time, a second time, even by our own logic, would seem to be easier. Because if you've made something one time, it's generally easier the second time around. Right? So there's the logic behind that. So the Arabs denied this idea of akhirah or the next world. Now the next world in the Quran is quite descriptive. And traditionally the Europeans often had a difficult time with it because it's, there are aspects of it that are quite sensual. Right? The idea of gardens under which rivers flow, of uh, fruits, of maidens and beautiful uh, youth, and these type of things. So this idea of an akhirah is being introduced into the Arabian culture. Now they obviously had some they're meeting the Christians and the Jews on their caravan routes and they're hearing about these things but they really had uh, an attitude that was basically characterized as disbelief. They did not believe in some other world. They thought this is it and for them the world was what they called muru'a, was virility, manhood, chivalry, poetry, women, wine, this was really the, the environment of the era. And they praised these, these uh, qualities and they praised these aspects of the world. And much of their poetry is about wine and women. Right? I mean, this is what they were interested in. Suddenly you have a book that's radically challenging that worldview. Radically challenging it. Very powerful experience for these people that are forced to begin to think about these things. Now, for the first 13 years, the Prophet is persecuted in Mecca. During this time, these people were learning the Qur'an that was being revealed by memory. The Qur'an was not revealed linearly, which is important because it's not a linear book. And that's something if you really want to understand the Qur'an or be able to read it, you have to surrender your desire for linearity. Right? Plato would probably have been able to read the book, Aristotle definitely not. He would have had a very hard time with this book because it does not begin in the beginning and end in the end. It just doesn't work like that. So in a sense, what the Quran really is demanding from people is that they submit to the book itself. And I think it's very fascinating that the, the, the really prob the first verse of Quran after the opening chapter is Arif Lam Mim. Three letters, nobody knows what they mean. Every commentator on the Quran will ultimately say about these three letters, God knows what they mean. Now, it's a very interesting phenomenon to open up a book and the first three letters that you read, nobody knows what they mean. And I think part of the message there is to let us know that there's a lot of things that we don't know. And if we're, not to, if we're not going to admit that as a starting point, we're not going to benefit from this book. If we're going to go to the book filled with ourselves, and we're going to superimpose upon the book our own ideas, then we're not going to get anything out of the book. So the book, for the 13 years, these Meccan verses are being revealed. Now if you look at the, the Meccan verses, they are, even though there are 85 of the chapters in the Quran are Mecca. 85. 39 of them are Medina. Only 11 out of the 30 parts of the Quran, equal parts, are from Mecca. Only 11. 19 are from Medina. So the Meccan surahs or chapters are very short. And they tend to fall towards the end of the book, even though they were revealed in the beginning of this uh, dispensation. <coughs> so although the, the Meccan verses are the first verses, they are generally the ones that are found at the end of the book, which is very interesting. And when Muslims learn the book by heart, they will generally begin at the end. That's where they'll begin. They'll begin, begin with the last 30th of the Quran. Now the next idea that is being introduced is the idea of what's called sa'a. And sa'a means the end of time. Now the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
his understanding of himself was that he was the first sign of the beginning of the end of the worldly existence of this Adamic species. He actually viewed himself as the first sign. In other words, all traditions that were based on revelation, according to the Islamic tradition, were basically indicating that the human experience will come to an end. And this is why within the, uh, the Jewish tradition, you have an apocalyptic vision. Within the Jewish tradition, you have an apocalyptic vision. Within the Hindu tradition, you have an apocalyptic vision, the Kali Yuga period, the last period of man. Within the Buddhist tradition, you have an apocalyptic tradition. And in many of the uh, more uh, uh, tribal-based traditions, within the Hopi tradition, the, the uh, Kawanaskatsi, the last period in the Hopi tradition, when everything gets out of control, within the Mayan, all these different uh, peoples had an idea of some apocalyptic end. The apocalyptic end in the Quran is talked about in terms of a sa'a, which is the last moment. It's the last moment. And the Prophet Muhammad talked about signs, and the Quran mentions signs of this time. And so this was also, now ultimately, uh, the end of time for the Muslim, in reality, is the end of our own individual life. That is our end of time. When I die, my worldly time is over. And so in a sense, the Quranic view was trying to bring people into a type of presence of the imminence of death. That death is imminent. That death is not something in some distant future. So for 13 years, this was the focus. After 13 years, the Quran is basically being memorized. And if you live with oral peoples, people that really uh, still maintain these traditions, and I know Dr. Suleiman Yang, who's from Africa, and, and knows in the West African oral tradition, there are peoples that will recite epic poems of tribes. If they don't ex recite them exactly as they learn them, then they literally lose their job. They can't be a storyteller. So the, the, the Arabs were people that memorized poetry and, and related poetry exactly which come. They had phenomenal memories. And I've lived with the Mauritanians in West Africa whose memories are extraordinary, like the young man who's here with us. Just phenomenal, the amount of uh, information that he retains exactly. Now for people that don't understand this oral tradition, they find it very hard to imagine that a human being can memorize this entire text, the Arabic text, and not make a mistake. Now I can bring that young man here and I can read the Quran and I can purposely leave out a verse and he'll correct me immediately. Now the other thing that's interesting about the Quran is for people who memorize it and even parts of it will quickly learn that the Quran is a self-correcting book because it has a very unusual rhythm that if you find a verse moves out of sync suddenly you're aware oh, I've, I've said something wrong. And I'll give you an example a few last week I, I read the uh, Subah prayer and it was, it was a rather long surah that I read. And at the end of it, um, I, I said a verse uh, that is actually out of the Quran, but it wasn't the verse that went in that place. And it used almost these same words. And that morning, probably for the next half hour, something was bothering me, and then I realized what it was. I said the verse wrong. And I, and I corrected myself. Nobody corrected me in the prayer, but I corrected myself. And it's very interesting when, when you memorize the Quran, because I've tried to memorize a lot of things. Like, you know, I used to uh, memorize some poetry. I went to prep school and you had to memorize poems and, and uh, memorize like some piece of Shakespeare and things like that. The really interesting thing about it is, is that the, the Quran, one, is facilitated. It's very easy to memorize. It's not hard to memorize for, for many, many people. And the other thing is, it's actually quite difficult uh, to forget it if you will recite it within reasonable time limits, repeat it every once in a while. It's very difficult to forget. But the Hafiz, or the one who preserves the Quran, is somebody who has memorized it by rote. It usually takes about, in, in the Indian subcontinent, they'll do it between a year and a half to two and a half years. In Mauritania, they have more rigorous uh, standards for because they have other things to learn than just rote memorization. They usually take about four years. 
doing it. And they do it when they're children. Um, the Arabs, they say, memorization in youth is like carving in stone. And memorization in old age is like painting on water. <laughs> and one of the uh, scholars, they said, it's not that the memory is gone. It's that we've got too many worries when we get older. Children, you know, they don't have to worry, so it all just sticks there. Or as you get older, you, you're thinking about a lot of other things. So, but it's still phenomenal what we memor memorize. So during these 13 years, the Quran is being memorized this way. It's also being written by the few people who know how to write it. Because most of the Arabs were illiterate. And the Prophet Muhammad said in a sound transmission, he said, we are an illiterate people. We don't read and we don't calculate. So he was admitting that about his people. The Quran itself says, He's the one who sent amongst the illiterates a messenger. That he recites to them his signs. And he purifies them. And he teaches them the book and wisdom. Even if they were in clear error before that. So the, the Prophet is seen as a messenger first and foremost to the Arabs, who are an illiterate people. Now, after 13 years of oppression, he makes a migration to Medina. Right? It's actually a flight. It's called the Hijrah. He, he flees there because they actually tried to kill him at that point. And he, he goes there and he, many people begin to become Muslim. Now the discourse, the Quranic discourse radically changes. From the Meccan period to the Medinan period, you will see a, a change between these two. The focus of the verses moves away from these topics to the social environment. How to implement. Once these have been internalized, interiorized, how are they implemented in social behavior? If you believe in God, what is that going to do to alter your character, to alter your behavior? How will that change you as an individual, as a person? So be, the focus becomes on character, on building a community, on building a society. So you will see many of the verses revealed in Mecca begin, O oh humanity, O oh humankind. But in Medina they begin, O oh you who have accepted. In other words, the call in Mecca was to people. From amongst those people, there were those who responded. And now the revelation is going to focus on creating an environment in which this teaching will manifest at the societal level, not simply at the individual level. And so the next 10 years are Medinan period. For 10 years, you call it the Medinan period. Now the interesting thing about the Quran is within Meccan verses are Medinan verses and within Medinan verses are Meccan ayats. In other words, there are sections because over the 23 year period, according to uh, the, the tradition of the, the Sunni Muslims, during this period, it's our belief that Jibreel uh, or Gabriel was coming to the Prophet and telling him the order that the Qur'an should be in. So it was revealed non-linearly, but now it begins to move into a type of uh, sequence. And beginning mostly with the Medinan surahs in the beginning and, and the Meccan surahs at the end. After uh, 10 years, during that time, the entire Qur'an is written during the lifetime of the Prophet, but it is not collected together. There is no collection. But during his lifetime, the entire Qur'an is written in his presence. And, and the Muslims don't have any doubt about that. The Orientalists, uh, the, the older ones are actually better than, than more the, the more recent ones from Germany. But, but they would definitely challenge that claim. But the Muslims would not. I mean, this is our belief that, that during that time. Now, in uh, 632, the Prophet Muhammad dies. And at that point, there are even a few revelations right before his death. And we know what they were, which verses they were. So the Prophet left companions behind who had memorized the entire Quran. And one of them was Ubay ibn Ka'ab, who the Prophet was commanded to have him recite the Quran to him and he would uh, listen to it. 
Many of the companions had memorized the Quran uh, during this time completely. At this point, they're teaching the people Islam is beginning to spread. Now, in 633, there was a battle called the Battle of Yamama. Several, and it was actually fighting people in the, in the uh, Nejd area who had, uh, there was a man there who had claimed that he was a prophet. And uh, Abu Bakr sent an army to these people. And there was a battle that ensued. And many of the Quran reciters were killed. People that knew the Quran by heart were killed in that battle. So at that point, in uh, Omar wants the, uh, the entire book to be collected. And he goes to Abu Bakr and he says, you have to collect this Quran. And Abu Bakr says, I'm not going to do something that the Prophet didn't do himself. In other words, the Prophet didn't put it in a book, collect it together, and I don't want to do that. And, Abu, and Omar kept telling him, you have to do this. This is a good thing. You must do this. What if people die? The Quran will get lost. And he said, finally, he said, I became convinced of that which uh, Omar was convinced of. He decides to collect the entire Quran. He gets one of the most learned people of the Quran, Zayd ibn Thabit. And he tells him, you need to gather the Quran. I want you to gather the Quran. Zayd says, how can you do something that the Prophet didn't do? They were very worried about introducing, because much of the Quran is talking about how previous uh, revelations were changed, that, that the people came after, they changed the teaching of the Prophet. So there was a real fear within the first community of doing anything that their Prophet uh, hadn't done. So he continues to tell Zay until Zay finally says, I realized that what Abu Bakr and Omar were saying was true. So they begin to collect it and they have a criterion. And the criterion is that each piece of the Quran must be brought that had been written in the presence of the Prophet with two witnesses. This is the criterion. And this takes place during that period. It took them a while to do this. And they did this. And there's only one verse. There's two uh, verses at the end of Surah at Tawbah, which is the, the chapter of repentance, that they could not find uh, two witnesses. They only had one, Khuzayma. Now, Khuzayma, uh, who was an Ansari from the people of Medina, there is a tradition that says that uh, a, a man from the people of the book uh, came to the Prophet and they, they, he disagreed with the Prophet about something. And there were no witnesses. And Khuzayma said, I'll bear witness for you, O Messenger of God. And, and the Prophet looked at him and he said, uh, do you, do you, were you there that you should believe me? And he said, we believe a revelation comes to you from God. So we won't believe you about a business transaction? <laughs> and so the Prophet said, the witnessing of Khuzayma is like two people. And so Khuzayma's, uh, those two verses, which were known by other companions, but it was the written in the presence of two witnesses that they wanted. They were accepted as part, and this was made into one mushaf, and w which literally comes from sahifa, which is tablets. And it was done, generally they used papyri and, and uh, gazelle, skin, leather, things like that. Prior to that, they'd been using uh, palm uh, wrists, and they were using uh, the shoulder blades from uh, uh, camels that are quite large to write uh, verses and things like this with soup. They would use a type of ink. Um, and this is how they were writing the Quran. They put the entire Quran, and it was kept... Uh, Omar kept it, and then it was given to Hafsa. Now, during the time of Uthman, who is the, the third caliph, there is a campaign uh, in Azerbaijan. And during this time, there began to be some differences amongst the, uh, amongst the Muslims about the recitation of the Quran. Because one of the things about the Quran is that it was being written, there was no standardized writing. So the Quran was literally being written, for instance, like this. There were no dots. What are these? these are called uh, uh, diacritical marks. There were no diacritical marks. There were no vowels. And so the book is like this. So you don't know if this is katabah, 
or if it's kitabun. Now, because of this reason, there were many people who memorized it and knew what it was, but there were other people that were beginning to learn it with the sheets and beginning to differ. So Uthman wanted to standardize the writing of the Quran. And this is done 658. The Prophet dies in 632. So Uthman begins to set out and standardize the Quran. And again, Zayd and three companions prepare, they go back to this Mus'haf of Hafsa, and they prepare the Quran according to Uthman's recommendations. And one of them was, if you differ about anything, then take the language of the Quraysh. Because there were different ways of pronouncing words. For instance, the, the Quraysh say Mu'min, and the Bani Tamim said Mu'min, like that. It's a difference. So there are different ways. The Quraysh said Waduhe, Walayhi Ida Sajjah, and uh, other tribes said Waduha, Walayhi Ida Sajjah. So you got differences of uh, pronunciation. So Uthman has this project carried through and then sends copies, identical copies, to the various centers of the Muslims and the governors and demands, as the head of the Muslim government, that all of the Qurans be burnt, except these that were based on this writing. Now this is very early because, I mean, if you look within the, uh, the Jewish tradition, the Bible, the, the Old Testament is really, it's gathered over about 900 years, basically, I mean, according to modern scholarship. And, and you have, you have a, there's four dominant versions, like the Yahweh, the Elohim, the Sakradal, uh, and you'll get some very, you'll get some big differences. The, the, within the Christian tradition also, the, the final codification is already 325 when, when there's an agreement on the three, uh, on the four uh, uh, Gospels at the Council of Nicaea. The companions of the Prophet himself were the ones that gathered and did this, and they were people who memorized the entire Quran from the Prophet based on this oral tradition. So the Qur'an itself, and this is really important to understand, the written Qur'an is not the primary source in which the Qur'an is protected. It is protected through oral transmission. This is used, one, for people who don't memorize the Qur'an, and two, as a crutch for people who memorize it to go back and be reminded if their teacher isn't there or somebody else who isn't a hafid. But I guarantee you, when they finish a printing of Qur'an, they send it to people who memorize the Qur'an orally to check it. They don't check it against other Qur'ans. They send it to several hufal, or the, 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 the people who memorize the Qur'an, and they will look at it. Imam al-Qurtubi tells a very interesting story in his tafsir, uh, in his commentary on the Qur'an, under the words uh, when uh, the Qur'an says, we have revealed the, this reminder and we have taken it upon ourselves, meaning God, it's, it's like a royal we in Arabic. And we have taken it upon ourselves to protect it. Imam al-Qurtubi says that there was a Jewish man who wanted to find out from the three traditions about the, their books. And so he took a Torah and he copied the entire Torah in Hebrew. And he put mistakes in it specifically. He went to a rabbi and he gave him the Torah and he asked him to read the entire Torah and tell him if it was a good addition. When he came back, the man said it was an excellent addition, even though he knew there were mistakes in it. When he went to the Christian, he did the same thing with the Gospels. And the, uh, the Christian also said that it was an excellent addition of the Gospels. He did the same thing for the Qur'an, and he went to a Muslim scholar and asked him to read it, and he had his mistakes in there, and the Muslim scholar told him when he came back, you have to burn this because there's mistakes in it. Now, if this is like an apocryphal story or a heavy rap, well, I don't know, it's historical validity, but I think the point is very well made. 
that the Muslims really do view the Quran and rightly and justifiably so as a book that is preserved since this early time. Now, in terms of what exists today, the, the Quran, we definitely, without any doubt, by, by even the consensus of Orientalists, have several parts of the Quran from early first century Islam. There would be some debate amongst Orientalists whether there is actually an edition of the Quran that goes back to this original Uthmani edition. The Muslims would say that there are two, possibly four. There is a copy now which is called the Samarkand copy, or Samarkand, which is, used to be southern Russia, which is now in Tashkent. And it is definitely a first century, but is it one of the original Uthmani? The Muslims believe it is. And there is also one in Egypt that definitely goes back to the year 68 after Hijra. Without a doubt, it's on gazelle leather, which lasts an incredibly long time. And then you also have uh, a, an edition which is in Nejef in Iraq, which is, uh, says at the end of it, and it's written in an authenticated Kufic script from that first period, it uh, says at the end that this was written by Ali, the fourth caliph. So, we believe that we do have original texts from this first period. But even if we didn't, there's no doubt in a Muslim scholar's mind, and the vast majority of Orientalists that have really examined the situation, like R.A. Nicholson, in his book called The Literary Era, uh, History of the Arabs, he was a Cambridge scholar, teacher of A.J. Arbery, who, who translated the Quran, or interpreted it into English, Nicholson says there's really no doubt about the authenticity, the historical authenticity of the Quran. Now this is not somebody who believes in, in, in the revelation, but he is accepting that the book is intact in terms of uh, its uh, historical authenticity. That this is the book that this original community was, uh, was hearing and was seeing. And so I'm just going to end it there and open it up for some, uh, just if there's any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we read today in the introduction, and you've made reference to it too, about uh, the use of we um, when, when God is speaking. And you said that it's like the royal we. Is that the only interpretation? In, of in the we? Arabic language, it's called uh, which means the plural of the one who's exalting himself. So from an Arab's perspective, if God's using it, it's acceptable. But when an individual uses it, it's arrogance. And you do find individuals in the Arab world that will say, uh, you know, we ate a lot today. And he's talking about himself. And, and it's actually uh, it's considered uh, bad manners. But it, it, this, is, this is the way it's actually Actually, it's never seen as the indicating royal. more than one God. Or absolutely not. Yeah. Well, I didn't absolutely mean to not. imply that. What's that? I didn't mean to imply that. I no, I know, but some, there's some other they're people. interestingly enough, like the Mormons, for instance, um, do believe that the we in the Old Testament is used to mean a multiplicity of gods. And some of the Christians have believed that the we of the Old Testament was used also to indicate the Trinity, for instance. I mean, there are many, you'll find this in, in many books, uh, Christian book. For the Jews, the Jews understand the same way that the, that the Arabs do. It's just a, a plural that's used majestically. Nahnu, it's a stronger. If I say ana, now the interesting thing about the Quran to me, and Cleary points this out, I think it's a really valid insight. Cleary says that one of the really interesting things about uh, the Quran is that the shift of perspectives. Because sometimes, uh, you know, the Quran is saying, I. La ilaha illa ana, there's no God but I. Sometimes la ilaha illa anta, there's no God but you. Sometimes la ilaha illa huwa, there's no God but uh, he. So it, it's shifting constantly, this change in perspective. Sometimes it's plural, sometimes it's singular. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very fascinating phenomenon in the form. Any other questions? Uh huh. Because, uh, we have this business of about uh, Poet Pat and Azalun Madea, and I understood that some of the leaves of the Tashkent Quran were pinched by his wife. Well, they end up in their possession. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, no, they, they say that a few of the leaves were
uh, stolen. And they also say, interestingly enough, in the, in the Treaty of Versailles, I think it's like uh, in the 246, the Article 246, one of the uh, conditions of surrender w to the Germans was that they would return the Uthmani copy of the Quran that was in their trust from the Ottomans. And that's a, a text that apparently just disappeared. One of them was destroyed in a fire in Syria, I think in 1898. So, um, but I have heard that. And some of them showed up in Sotheby's. Yes, this is some reason. Yeah, some of them showed up for sale at Sotheby's, caused by a scandal. Uh -huh. When heaven is described as uh, there being maidens and uh, beautiful attendant youths, is this uh, to be taken literally? Yes and no. Well, if it's now, don't no, you teach that's philosophy? Pardon me? Are you a teacher of philosophy? Yeah. That's right. Okay. So, because <laughs> philosophers generally can deal with a yes or no answer. <laughs> Um, there's, a, there's a type of paradox here. One, on the one hand, we don't say that it doesn't not mean that. On the other hand, we certainly don't say that it means like we understand here. Right? The paradise, according to the Muslim, it says uh, the, the, the best description of it, according to the Revelation, is what no eye has seen, and no ear has heard, and has never occurred to the human mind. So. There's an idea that we really can't understand what it is, but we know that it is, uh, it is going to be the greatest uh, experience of felicitousness. It's called Sa'ada. And one of the uh, 13th century scholars actually said that, that the, sexual, the sexual pleasure was the highest physical pleasure that God has given the human being. Not the highest mental, because they believe there is higher. But it was the highest. And he actually said that this was to give the human being a taste, just for a moment, of a glimpse of the approximation of, of the delights of paradise. So the Muslims, I don't think, have ever been like prudish about those types of things. You know? I mean, there's not, the Prophet was not a sensualist by any means. And people that say that are, it's a gross disservice to his character, because he was not. And he could certainly have been. And, and I don't think, even had he been, he, he would not have been faulted by his people. But he was not. Uh, his wives were elderly women. They were widows and orphans, uh, with, the, uh, and, uh, with the exception of one. Uh -huh. um, I have a statement. It's not really a question. But you talked about the Torah and the gospel being written and of putting these on mistakes and on purpose. There's a tradition among scribes of the Torah, which are always handwritten, to always have a mistake put into the Torah to show man's imperfection. It would be arrogant for a Hebrew scribe to ever try to say, this is perfect. There's only God who creates something. Well, see, this Any is man. That's a really good I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's a really good point. Be a, just a, a sin of arrogance. Because, see, the Muslims believe that the Quran is the divine word of God and therefore they believe that to put a mistake in it would be of the greatest transgression. In other words, that it is a sacred trust. And in fact, the Quran says that we gave this trust, we offered this trust to the heavens, to the earth, and to the mountains. And they refused to bear it, but the human being bore it. Now it's interesting because in the, according to the Quran, the Jews and the Christians said بِمَسْتُحْفِلُ that they were given the task themselves of protecting their books and they fell short. That's what the Quranic version is. But then it says about the Quran because it's the final one, there would be no prophet after the prophet to clarify that there were mistakes. It says that God alone has taken it upon God, the divine, to protect this book. So the Muslims actually believe that it is divinely protected for that very reason. And I'm really glad you brought up that point because I think it's a really, it's a, it's a very pertinent uh, point. I just added a postscript to that because when uh, Arabs were doing the carpet work, they make a deliberate mistake and it's 
right? A carpet with a mistake is a lot worth a lot more than a carpet that's uh, made by a machine in Belgium. <laughs> Anything else? Uh -huh. I'm curious, how many people approximately know the entire crew? I would say it, it's probably, it, it's probably, if not uh, in the hundreds of thousands, I would say it's, you know, it would be hard to estimate, but I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was in Mauritania, um, the tribe that I stayed with, and there's uh, several thousand of them, none of the men uh, do not know the Quran by heart. Every single, it, it's like a prerequisite for that tribe. His, the tribe that man's from, they all memorize the Quran. And the women, some of them memorize the entire Quran, most of them memorize at least like a third. So they're really, I mean, it's very, I mean, you can go, if you go to Mecca, it's very interesting. When you're at Mecca, there's a million people there. And I feel sorry for the Imam, because he's got a microphone. <laughs> if he makes a mistake, right? <laughs> He'll make a mistake, boom! You just hear voices from all over breaking in and correcting him. <laughs> from everywhere, really. <laughs> And it's actually, it's not encouraged to do that. You're supposed to give the imam a break <laughs> and let him correct himself. But people are so overzealous. You know, it's like a, a knee-jerk response. They hear a mistake and they, ah, made a mistake. And it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And at my mosque where I pray, there's about seven or eight that are hofa, which is in America. So that, that's, that's a small number. But if you go to Pakistan, filled with people that memorize the Quran. West Africa, filled with people. Egypt, filled with people that memorize the Quran. Many in Syria, many women in Syria. There's been a recent phenomenon of, of women memorizing the Quran in Syria. Uh, many, many women. Turkey, all over the Muslim world you have. And many of the best Quran reciters are not Arabs. Right, in fact, some of the best are Malaysian women. Uh-huh. Sorry, you keep doing this. I'm <laughs> but it's the practical though. You see, I, I don't know the Quran by heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm working on my work. If I need to know something, I ring up the bookshop in London and I just say to the girl on the desk, can you just have a shout, is there a Hafiz in the shop? And she would say, is anybody here who memorized the entire Quran? And the customer would say, yes, I know. You know, they'll come to the phone and ask. Yeah, it's very common. It really is. It's very common. I mean, if you're in a mosque praying, you'll at least have one or two that memorize the entire Quran, and many that memorize large portions of it. And it really, it is the book that has created literacy uh, in, 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 in the world. I mean, it, it's, you know, if you go to a country where they say that people are illiterate, the vast majority of people traditionally in the Muslim world could read and, and recite the Quran and many could understand it because Arabic was, it was like the lingua franca. It was the Latin of the Muslim world. It's a sacred out of language. Uh -huh. You mentioned uh, last night that your teacher that uh, has memorized, like, it was like the seventh version of- There's seven variants. Now, I'm glad you mentioned that. There's, because uh, I did, forgot to mention that. There are seven variants which are dialectical. In other words, some of the Arabs could not pronounce the, the Prophet's uh, life language. And so the Quran was revealed in different variants based on the different tribes. And they're all accepted. There's seven of them. And it's a hadith that's written. It does not change the meaning by consensus. You will find no doctrinal change in the Quran. For instance, I learned according to Imam Warsh, who's the African reciter. And there are other people who recite, the vast majority of Muslims recite by uh, Asim or Hafs, who's originally from Kufa. If they hear me reciting and they're ignorant, they might think I'm making mistakes. You see, they might think, I'm, but if they're educated, they'll know right away he's reading a sound variant. So, just to give you an example, if I said uh, in uh, Surah Al Fatiha, I would say, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin, Ar Rahman ar Rahim, Maliki Yomi Din, in Wash, in Hafs, Maliki Yomi Din. Now, Maliki means the possessor of the Day of Judgment. Meliki means the king. So the, the meaning is not changed. They, they're both... They're, they're both uh, Maybe you should write that word and they can see it. Well, yeah, just the difference here. Same root. 
And the difference would be in the house, there's a there's just a mark right there, Maliki. And, and in the Barsh, Maliki, like that. So there's only a few differences like that. The others will be more in pronunciation. So it, it's time for the, the prayer. <laughs>